Bulk. All right, they're going to get on the uh, Alternative Socialist and uh, the uh, UCAM Socialist Group, and they've got uh, material out there as, uh, um, right on the shelf as you go out if you want to take a look at it. Um, and also, the RCP, do you, do you have some material with you as well today? No, I don't. Okay. RCP, as you know, has a bookstore in town, um, so um, if you want to get a uh, hold of the material or their website, um, it's linked on the Facebook event page for today. All right, so I think that's everything. So this uh, panel, Marxism and Anarchism, um, was launched last February in Halifax. It's uh, gone to eight places since. It was in Thessaloniki, Greece after that, Frankfurt, London, Knoxville, Tennessee, Chicago, um, and now we're in Montreal. So it's really, we're really pleased to do this. The past recordings are all on the website. Uh, with that, I want to introduce our panel today. Um, and, um, uh, and we have all just, ex I think except for Dimitri, I think we've all just met tonight. So, um, Julian, what's your say your last name? Daniel. Daniel, thank you. Uh, Julian is a freelance journalist doing a master's degree in communication at UCAM. He's one of the founding members of Alternative Socialists, which is a uh, uh, part of the it's a CWI branch here in Quebec. And he's a full time he's full time with the uh, UCAM uh, 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 so Student Socialist Group Committee. Uh, Catherine Janvier. Say it for everybody. No, no, it's perfect. Okay. <laughs> was involved in various mobilizations in the last years, including uh, the March 8th demo organized by uh, women of diverse origins, student mobilization against the G20, organization of anti-capitalist May 1st demos, the student strike of 2012, and she's now involved in the campaign for a spring 2015 protest against austerity. She's a militant of the Revolutionary Communist Party and especially involved in the construction of a pan-Canadian revolutionary student movement and the establish of a proletarian <laughs> feminist line. And I'm also trying to survive. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, beside Catherine, there's William Robert. Roberts. He's an assistant professor of political science at McGill. He's written several articles on Marx and the history of Marxist theory. And he's just completed a book manuscript on Marx's capital, which in part situates capital within the context of the International Working Men's Association as a response to Proudhon in particular. And finally, uh, I'm pleased to have, uh, this is, uh, I think, the third panel. You've been, you've been on a Marxism and Anarchism panel before in Chicago. We have Dmitry Rusopoulos, who all of you, of course, know. He's one of the most significant figures to emerge from the Canadian New Left. Uh, and... Um, He's not only been a highly effective activist, but he's demonstrated an unparalleled commitment in creating independent outlets for descending writers to express themselves in print, including Black Rose books. And I, I myself was over at Black Rose today and uh, got the three-volume series <laughs> of uh, Robert Graham's books, uh, which I think are going to be for sale in the bookstore so, um, on anarchism. So, great book. Okay. Um, and he's also, uh, as I also learned when I was at Black Rose today, um, the previously iconic journal, All, Our Generation, which uh, ran for up until the 1990s, correct? Uh, he's also been a, a key participant in the development of social ecology internationally, and currently sits as the chair of the Transnational Institute of Social Ecology. One thing I did notice in the, uh, I was reading uh, from Our Generations, this magazine that went for a long time, there was a quote by C. Wright Mills in one of the first issues. Um, I'm going to quote that is to begin the panel today. It's, it quote goes, it's not, it is, is it not precisely the task of intellectual and scholars, the scholar, the student, to confront complications, to sort out insistent issues in such a way as to open them up and work, uh, uh, open them up, uh, open them up, uh, as to open them up for the work of reason, and so for action at strategic points of intervention. Is it not our task to continually make the new beginning? And I think that's what uh, we hope to happen tonight. Uh, Marxism and anarchism have been around for an awfully long time. And the question is, what does it mean for us today? So I'm going to, everybody had this uh, panel description. I'm going to quickly read it and then hand it over to Julian to start the panel off. It seems that there are only two radical ideologies, Marxism and anar anarchism and Marxism. They emerged out of the same crucible, the Industrial Revolution, the unsuccessful revolutions of 1848 and 1871, a weak liberalism, the centralization of state power, 
the rise of the workers' movement, and the promise of socialism. They are the revolutionary heritage, and all significant <coughs> radical upsurges of the last 150 years have returned the mind their meaning for the current situation. In this respect, our moment seems no different. There are a few different ways these ideologies have been taken up. Recently, worldwide square occupations reflect one pattern. A version of Marxist theory, understood as a political economic critique of capitalism, is used to comprehend the world, while an anarchist practice, understood as an anti-hierarchical principle that insists revolution must begin now, is used to organize in order to change it. Some resist this combination, claiming that Marxism rejects anti-status adventurism and call for a strategic reorganization of the working class to resist austerity and perhaps push forward a new New Deal. This view remains wedded to a uh, supposedly practical, welfareist social democracy which strengthens the state and manages capital. There's a good deal of hand-waving in both these orientations with regards to politics, tactics, and the end goal. Finally, there have been attempts to leave the grounds of these theories altogether, but these often seem to right, land right back in one of the camps or remain marginal. To act today, we seek to draw on the balance sheet of the 20th century. The historical experience concentrated in these ideas must be unfurled if they're to serve as, a comp as compass points. To see in what ways the return of these ideologies re represent an uh, authentic engagement, in what ways they're a return of a ghost. Where have, the, where have these battles left us? What forms do we have for meeting, theoretically and practically, the problems of the present? The way the panel's going to go, the, each of the panels have 10 to 12 minutes. I'm going to enforce this strictly so at 12 minutes, I'm, even if you're saying something brilliant, I'm going to have to unfortunately <laughs> cut you off. <laughs> After that, the panelists will have a, a, an opportunity for one to three minutes to respond to one another. So we're keeping this all very short so they have a, we have a chance to then do a Q&A. I'll take questions in uh, groups of three so that we can get a good discussion going, and the panelists can choose which of those questions they want to take up. But if I notice a question's being left off, I'll, I'll make sure that the panelists have a chance to sort of retake it, take it up again. <coughs> um, I think that's all the good. We're going we're gonna to end at nine sh sharp. So if you're wondering, you know, i got to get home, we're going to end at nine sharp, and I think if you want to continue, we're going to go for beer somewhere afterwards. With that, Julian, take it away. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much for having me here uh, tonight. So as you may um, uh, hear, I'm not bilingual. I'm uh, French-speaking, uh, so uh, forgive me uh, my accent. And I'll mostly read my presentation because I'm not enough fluid in English. So, uh, for my part, I would like to talk about the, the methods and the strategy for struggle used by different currents in anarchism and Marxism, especially here in Quebec. Uh, some strategies are currently more popular than others, and this is the case with <coughs> horizontal, decentralized, or network organizing. In Quebec, the number of uh, identity groups, anti-capitalist network, or the ephemeral Occupy movement show the popularity uh, of this approach. Uh, this, without a doubt, arises uh, from a very sincere activists uh, who want to rebuild a militant praxis that has suffered from uh, years of sectarianism, authoritarian excesses, and the failures of the left. Uh, however, uh, from my point of view, this approach is perfectly in line with the, the capitalist discourses of individu individualism, which promises democratization through digital technology. Uh, you might remember the media telling us that Facebook caused the Tunisian revolution. Uh, horizontal approach is uh, completely severed from revolutionary strategic thought, <coughs> which, which aims to mobilize the masses in order to uh, obtain power. So first, I'll, I'll try to describe what I'm, I'm, I'm understanding of the network organization. So um, network organizations promote a radical democracy in opposition, in opposition to a representative democracy. Network organizations have no overt leadership and often don't have formal structures. They are essentially form of the constant stream of new members joining and leaving the movement. Therefore, the lack of orientation affects the political coherence of uh, this kind of group. Uh, top network organizing is not specifically anarchist, it is widely popular among anarchist circles. 
This method is also used by the uh, global justice movement as uh, socialist and even uh, used by uh, right-wing uh, libertarians. Nonetheless, uh, one thing is clear for, for Quebec's left and the working class, this strategy has been a failure for the 15 years. No network organization can claim to have maintained a real balance of power with any government or elite group. The victories obtained for the popular classes are extremely limited and localized. On the other hand, the right-wing discourses uh, is more hegemonic than ever. Uh, the elite use public institutions in their interests even more. The frontal assault of neoliberal measures uh, that we experience right now shows the weakness of the left and the lack of organization of the working class in Quebec. The, the impact of the network organizing is limited because it discards tools revolutionary movements have been victorious with in the past, such as uh, social class analysis links between a uh, revolutionary movement and the institution of the working class, a coherent political project and the authority required in any form of organization. I'll only speak about this last aspect uh, tonight. So one of the fantasies of horizontal organizing is to decentralize power in order to eliminate the inherent authority of hierarchy. Uh, an organization without hierarchy, hierarchy must, by essence, be without authority relations. These discourses confuse authority with domination or submission. Even in a world where uh, social revolution has triumphed, material conditions of production and circulation impose a certain authority and a certain subordination. This situation, this situation is unavoidable, un, unavoidable when technology is involved. For instance, uh, to eliminate all authority in the chain of interdependent action of the healthcare system would mean to eliminate the healthcare system altogether. Uh, for me, the real question is, uh, which kind of authority do we want? Authority and individual autonomy are concepts relative, relative to each other, <coughs> not ideas that are, that are absolutely good or bad. As the anarchist uh, Catherine Baker wrote, the only useful struggle is not against authority, but against submission. Uh, to demand that the first act of a social revolution be the suppression of authority is simply incoherent and destined to fail. According to uh, Frederick Engels, there is nothing more authoritarian than a revolution. Uh, this process involves a part of the population imposing its will on another using violence and maintaining its authority thereafter with terror as long as necessary. The principal rejection of authority took one of its most disastrous form in the military failure of strategics strategies put forward by the anarchist militia during the Spanish War. Uh, we, maybe we could talk about it later, but I, I won't develop <coughs> on this point right now. Um, what I want to say is that power, authority, centralism, <coughs> and the discipline required are strategic questions, not dogmatic principles. Uh, opposing Marxist and anarchist group on the basis of uh, authoritarian or anti-authoritarian essence is pointless. Strategies cannot be dogmatic. They must adapt to different contexts. Um, network organizers feed what Jody Dean call the fantasies of participation and abundance. It is based on the conviction that enhanced communication access facilitate democracy. In a network organization, all contributions are uh, considered equal and uh, equivalent. Thus, uh, the goal is not to take concerted action, but it's to communicate, to understand one another. This capture the political energies and reduce politics to communicative acts. On one end, this approach falls in the democratic rhetoric of liberalism about the intrinsical emancipatory role of the digital technologies <coughs> in our lives. 
on the other hand, it creates a, an individualistic withdrawal which prevents any strategic action mobilizing more than an identity group. Uh, under the cover of a false pluralism, it rejects any massive concerted strategies for the benefit of a myriad of disorganized <coughs> and contradictory microactions. Um, another fantasy uh, concerned the, the belief that there is no leadership in a network organization. Uh, the works of uh, Albert Laszlo Barabasi demonstrate, however, that on the web, as in the, any uh, scale-free network, there are hubs and hierarchies that emerge out of growth and preferential attachment. In real networks, linking is never random. Instead, popularity is attractive. Uh, the belief in networks denying the informal hierarchies as well as the political conflict, the different political conflicts uh, within an organization. It opens the door to infiltration tactics, which are at best disconnected from political consciousness of the majority, at worst, anti-democratic. Uh, this, uh, <coughs> this is how minority ideas of political groups can be imposed <coughs> on larger organization. This is notably the case with the, um, some groups in UCAM Comité Printemps 2015. Uh, its revolt slogans and commando actions of uh, last fall speaks volumes. Uh, even if the most motivated activists successfully got their um, uh, successfully got almost every faculty student association to back their activities, the vast majority of students were not mobilized or even aware of what was happening. Um, the usefulness and representativity of commando action performed by an handful of activists is highly questionable when several thousand students were technically on strike. Uh, this type of mobilization is not sufficient to build a balance of power with anybody. The most militant of activists risk burning out. This approach digs even further the gap between the political consciousness of the majority of the students and the consciousness of the vanguard who claims to speak in the name of the whole studi student body. Um, a student mass movement will occur through its own democratic structure, uh, the association, unions, while adopting uh, discourses in sync with the consciousness of the m student masses to, to subcontract political work to an ad hoc horizontal committee like Comité Printemps 2015 is a strategic mistake. <coughs> not that this committee should not exist, <coughs> it, is useful, it is useful to support and catalyze the mobilization of students, but it doesn't have the legitimacy nor the representativity to replace the actions of student association and mobilization committees. I'll conclude uh, uh, on, on this. Um, in this specific context, as well as in the more general social struggles, uh, the majority must democratically set a political agenda and action plan in order not only to resist, but to win. We will not achieve anything on the basis of scattered struggles or fragmentary identities. To refuse to acknowledge that our working class identity transcends all is to refuse to think about power on a higher society scale, on who has this power and how we can take it. The aim of revolutionary Marxists is to mobilize masses on the basis of a transitional demands in order to take power. It starts from the actual political consciousness of the working class, using concrete demands that reflects the, the actual life of real people. These, uh, this, uh, these transitional demands bridge between everyday life, necessities, and the necessity to overthrow capitalism to ensure a better future for the 99%. Networks organization can participate to this effort. Even on, even of, on a massive scale. However, the limits of their orga organizational form don't allow to reach a conscious, a conscious revolutionary scope. <coughs> a convergence between anarchists and Marxists won't happen <coughs> around a common program, values, or morals. It is, however, possible on the practical field, like in the past, through campaigns. Uh, for the defense of the interests of the working class. So uh, that's what I had to say. Thank you very much.
just to keep everything coherent. But, uh, Will, why don't you go next to then Catherine? Does that yeah, sound yeah, good? It's fine. It's fine. <coughs> um, I'd like to thank Anne and Ian uh, for organizing this. Um, uh, and I'd like to apologize. I'm, uh, I've got an, I'm pretty sick, but I've really hopped up on cold medicine. <laughs> so um, I think I'll be functional. I may be a little stupid. We'll see. Okay. Um, so <coughs> I'm sort of the odd one out here. I'm, I'm here uh, as a student of the history of socialism and anarchism and nothing more. Um, but uh, I think that history is instructive in a couple of regards. Uh, the first point I'd like, and I mean a couple of regards, I have two points that I'd like to make. Uh, the first point I'd like to make is that uh, the issue that divided Marx from the prominent anarchists of his day also divided him pretty much uh, from every other socialist or communist agitator or writer <coughs> of any uh, renown in the 19th century. Um, in other words, Marx was the outlier amongst 19th century socialists. Um, and in order to see how, I want to paint a brief picture of the context. So like by the, the last decade of the 19th century, uh, two names were associated above all others with the socialist threat, uh, the infamous specter of communism. Um, Karl Marx and Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Uh, one, a uh, prolific writer uh, and self-declared disciple <coughs> of Hegel and Adam Smith, coined the term scientific socialism for his brand of critical theory, denounced the fetishism of money, and pronounced himself a spokesperson for the proletariat in its efforts to complete the revolution that had been begun by the bourgeoisie in 1798. I mean, 1789, sorry. Uh, he had a large following among workers and was quite famous, in part for his polemics with other socialists of the day, whom he considered to be insufficiently radical in their attacks on private property and on the state. The other, much more obscure in his own time, was Marx. <laughs> um, so if you were surprised by that last sentence, uh, you're hardly alone. Although Marx's uh, mockery of Proudhon in his 1847 property, uh, Poverty of Philosophy is fairly well known, the extent and precise nature of the relationship between the two um, and, um, has really never been examined in any great depth. In particular, no one has ever really appreciated the extent to which Marx's capital uh, is an argument with Proudhon about what capitalism is, how it works, what its effects are, uh, and what it would mean to overthrow <coughs> it. Uh, and this is what I really study. Um, Capital was written by Marx uh, within the context of the International <coughs> Working Men's Association, uh, by far the largest contingent within the International Working Men's Association were French Proudhonists, um, and uh, Proudhon's influence, and not just Proudhon's direct influence, but Proudhon's similarity to uh, so many other strands within uh, 19th century socialism and 19th century workers' movements, um, really uh, was at the forefront of Marx's concern when he was writing <coughs> Capital. The central disagreement, just to boil it down to uh, the nut, uh, between Marx and Proudhon is that Marx opposed Proudhon's moralism. Uh, what I mean by moralism is nicely summed up by Proudhon's claim in What is Property that equality of condition has never been realized thanks to our passions and to our ignorance. Um, and if what stands between our present condition, <coughs> I'm going to just explicate this a little bit. If what stands between our present condition, Proudhon called it capitalistic feudalism, um, and a condition of equality, justice, and free association, Proudhon called it anarchy or mutuality, um, are our passions and our ignorance, then the way to overcome these barriers is to tame our passions and to educate our ignorance, right? to educate ourselves about our duties, about how to be just. For Proudhon, the greed and selfishness of some and their recourse to force and to fraud, to conquest and to treachery, explain the massive disparities of wealth 
and well-being observed in the world. So the solution is to treat one another with justice, to recognize one another as equals, to lend one another our support, and to build a new world within the old one. For Proudhon, we need to become better people. Uh, we need to be the change we want to see in the world, etc. <laughs> Um, willpower, education and enlightenment, virtue. Uh, these are the late motifs of Proudhon, of Proudhonian anarchism, and, and this is my, the, I think, the crucial point, of moralistic socialism as it existed in the 19th <coughs> century. And this was the vast majority of socialism in the 19th century. Um, these traits were not peculiar to Proudhon at all. Despite all of his iconoclastic polemics against other socialists, and despite his uh, really virulent anti-feminism, which truly was unusual, um, Proudhon was actually quite a mainstream socialist in the 19th century. He was much sharper and a much better writer than many, but the notion that capitalism was essentially a moral problem to be solved by the reform of people's consciousness and or their character, or by the replacement of the bad people by the good people, was ubiquitous, was common to you across the field. Marx's divergence from this moralistic mainstream of socialist thought was a gradual development, uh, but quite clearly on display by the time he wrote Capital in 1867. His opposition to moralism is not due to him thinking that morality is just ideology, um, nor is it due to some sort of proto-Nietzschean immoralism. Um, <coughs> Marx just didn't think capitalism was a problem of bad people. No one is responsible for capitalism, according to Marx. Um, no one's in charge of it. Uh, to introduce a bit of social science jargon, capitalism is a giant collective action problem. Uh, we are all, including capitalists and the state, dominated by the imperatives of capital itself. That is, by the imperatives of uh, the competitive market and of production for surplus that follow from that. This is not anyone's fault. Um, we stumbled into this, and now we don't know how to get out. Moralizing that is, decrying how bad it is, uh, condemning people for it, uh, exhorting or imploring people to change themselves and to buck the system, uh, fails to touch the basic phenomenon. People, including the rich and powerful, including even the state itself, are actually dependent upon the market. And this dependency renders them irresponsible. So uh, at the close of the 18th century, Mary Wollstonecraft was prompted by women's domination by men to ask, how can a being be virtuous who is not free? Marx, prompted by society's general and the workers' particular domination by capital, <laughs> asked the same question. Right? How, can a being who is, how can a being be virtuous who is not free? And in some sense, moralism... Like, if I wanted to boil it down, moralism uh, says that sort of in order to be, uh, in order to make ourselves free, we have to be virtuous. Uh, and Marx and many other thinkers reverse that and say, no, we have to be free uh, in order to be virtuous. For Marx, then, the problem to be solved was uh, who is so situated in the modern world that they without being asked to change either their consciousness or their character, might have both the motive and the power to overthrow capital. How might those people be encouraged to appreciate the motive that they have um, and to use the power that's at their disposal? So, of course, Mar Marx's solution to this problem was that the class of wage laborers had both the motive and the power uh, that the rule of capital fairly compelled them to organize themselves, and that this self-organization might lead, via the seizure and dismantling of the state, 
and the seizure and cooperation of the major means of production to universal emancipation. In short, Marx had a theoretical account of capitalism as generalized servitude or slavery, which account rendered the moralism of the anarchists and of most all socialists inappropriate to the task of overthrowing capitalism. And this leads me to the second point that I wanted to make. Marx's identification of the modern proletariat as the potential agent of universal emancipation was, of course, taken up in the 20th century by a number of coordinated party organizations. By their internal structures of decision-making and program formation, Marxism became an identifiable constellation of partisan ideas, just as liberalism and conservatism were, in the European context at least, identifiable partisan groupings. Um, Marxism, in this sense, fell apart in the wake of 1989. Uh, and in fact, it had been falling apart since the Sino-Soviet split, at least uh, um, since the critique of Stalinism as a cult of personality. So the process of dissolution um, has gone so far now that I would not hesitate to say that while there are many people who identify themselves as Marxists, there's no real saying who's right or wrong in doing so. Right? Marxism has, for all intents and purposes, ceased to exist. And that means it's now on the same plane as anarchism. It's not a party idea. Um, it's a subculture, or a set of overlapping subcultures, a set of ideas that float around. Um, <clears throat> And I think that's interesting because we are essentially returned to the situation before Marx. We're returned to the situation in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and the moralism that prevailed a bunch of 19th century socialists and anarchists prevails again today, not that it ever went away. Uh, Marxism had some powerfully moralistic currents within it, but without any organizational counterweight, moralism now seems to define much of the left. left and perhaps Marx's own intervention is timely today. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's going to be like that. <coughs> so, yeah. just uh, just like we uh, <coughs> just talked about. In the history of the proletariat and the struggle for communism, few issues were the subject of as many debates as the one over the content of the period which follows capitalism and leads to communism. And one thing in common between Marxists and anarchists is probably uh, that we all want to reach a free equalitarian society rid of any form of exploitation and state. Um, and in various period of histories and various countries, honest revolutionary minded people were attracted to sometimes Marxism and sometimes to anarchism because it seems that anarchism was more revolutionary than Marxism could be. Uh, then I go back to the description of the panel because it was kind of a teaser and as a Maoist I was like, hmm, like, you know, we are not uh, in favor of this idea of a new New Deal. Actually, we boycott the state, we boycott the elections. Uh, and to some extent, I could say that for many communists, we are maybe too anarchists, and for many anarchists, we are way too much communists. So it's a, a funny third uh, way to, to, to the debate between Marxism and anarchism. Um, and yeah, in some ways, the, the, the I'm going to talk a lot about the practice of the Revolutionary Communist Party in Canada because it's my experience. I may talk a little bit about the experience in the United States, but not a lot. But like, if you're familiar with the, the militant media in the last decades or so in Montreal, but now <clears throat> more and more in Toronto and Vancouver and other uh, important cities in Canada, uh, the uh, Maoist has been uh, involved in all the places where the anarchists are, actually. Uh, in big mass mobilization, like you heard about them, uh, the G20 uh, mobilization against the, uh, the youth summit in 2001 in Quebec, uh, summit of the Americas, uh, the annual demonstration, the annual anti-anti-capitalist <coughs> anti demo for May first, uh, and more generally, we are to some extent involved in the student movement, in the feminist movement, in various movements. Uh, so, what's the, the to to some extent, the Maoists are 
inside the the mass movement we, where mostly anarchist people are. But at the same time, we are also outside. It's a bit of a dialectical process um, between the two. And like when when Lenin said that without a revolutionary theory, you cannot have a, a, a revolutionary practice. I think he was essentially uh, leading to three main uh, things that we need to, to address in order to, to be able to develop a correct revolutionary strategy. is the, the understanding of the causes of exploitation, the understanding of the development of society, which leads to socialism, <coughs> sorry, and the understanding of the class struggle as a creative force for the realization of socialism. <coughs> Um, and now, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. uh, what we can see uh, it's uh, within the anarchist movement is actually two main tendencies. One is around direct action, uh, and the other one is kind of an anarcho-syndicalist strategy, mostly articulated around uh, we should follow the organized workers' movement, rather trade unions or other uh, movement, and. Uh, like support their struggles in uh, the hope that those struggles are going to uh, <coughs> get out of the, the the framework imposed by the the, the bourgeois legality. Um, but like the 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 Marxist point of view uh, in its Maoist application, if this 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 distinction is necessary, is that. Um, the revolution needs a unification of various objective factors. Those are pretty simple factors, an economical and political crisis which affects all classes. The incapacity for the bourgeoisie to maintain its domination intact or so. And the incapacity for the proletariat and the masses to live just like they did before. But to all those three objective factors, you need to add a subjective one, which is a revolutionary <coughs> political leadership. Uh, and without it, you can have a lot of uh, revolts that you need to support. Like when when Mao said that um, it's right to rebel, uh, it applies to all kind of situations. And like this is why the Mao is here in Canada, but also through the world, so always support the, the demands of the masses, whether they're pretty reformists or really revolutionaries or no matter what. This is not really important. But the thing that you need to do is that to, some, to understand is that to some extent, you cannot really change directly the objective factors like individually as a militant, you cannot uh, cause a political crisis uh, at the parliament. That's not really feasible. But what you can do is to develop the subjective factor, the revolutionary political leadership. And while you're developing this political leadership and you're involved within the mass struggles, you're involved in major events, uh, and you're, you build your own party, some mass organization, some whatever, this subjective factor, even if it's small at the beginning, has to some extent an influence on those objective factors. First consequence that like we are facing as maybe some of you are too, is repression from the state. Uh, security services, uh, political arrest, and all those kind of things. You can say it's not a lot, and that majority of Canadian masses don't give a fuck about the fact that a few militants are repressed by the police. But this is kind of a dialectical process in which the more and more you can uh, develop your subjective factor to a political leadership, more and more you have an influence on the objective factors. <coughs> Sorry, it's pretty difficult. Yeah, okay. So, since the collapse of the USSR and the Eastern Bloc, uh, it, it has been said that socialism is no longer feasible or that Marxism is a failure or all those kind of things. And even if we just take the, the, the question of uh, social classes, all types of explanations are made in order to prove that the working class has vanished or is waning. Uh, rather, technological development or automation that replaces people, the increasing army of workers <laughs> that gives the impression of being excluded for the working market, uh, the middle class status of some workers, uh, among the proletariat who gain a bit from the plundering of imperialism, <coughs> actually. And that's for the situation in the first world. I will refer a bit to the situation in countries uh, that are dominated by imperialism because I think it's something really important to take in consideration even when we're having all those debates about Marxism and anarchism. It's really, really easy to fall into Eurocentrism or North American centrism while there are millions of people 
especially in India and the Philippines, but also in small country or small region like Manipur and Bhutan and other countries and lands and whatever the names that those peoples want to give to to, to, to their part of the earth um, that are going on and that are making some important historical development in the revolutionary process with some failures for sure but it's something that we need to learn from and it's really easy to to just forget it so uh, to say that there are there is not a uh, proletariat here anymore you, you need to ignore reality. It really is a deep lack of understanding about what the proletariat is, actually. A class whose existence is defined by its role in the relations of production. A state of affairs that has nothing to do with a personal desire, just like we talk, or a political weed. Well, uh, that these relations of production change to the extent that the bourgeoisie can now exist without the proletariat? Of course not. Uh, as a matter of fact, things do change, more, most certainly. The development of capitalism, the worsening of competition and class struggles are factors that bring constant changes. This includes changes within the proletariat, namely in its composition. However, these changes do not modify its relationship to the ruling class. On the contrary, it is the very nature of this relationship that explains these ongoing changes. And like, i end on that, <laughs> because I guess times is <coughs> running out. So a rather odd and historical position held by the advocates of various country, <coughs> of various currents <laughs> approach is that communism is a failed ideology and thus an historical anachronism due to its inability to address and comprehend the struggles of oppressed group that fall outside of rubric of class. Communism should only be concerned with class as class, and the story goes, and because of this concern has either been quite chauvinistic when it comes to the struggles of oppressed peoples whose oppression is not supposedly defined by class, or had just been incapable of addressing these problematics. And it is true that in the Marxist history, there has been major important failures to address those, uh, those issues. I'm talking probably especially about women's liberation, LGBTQ struggles, and all those kinds of struggles. <coughs> um, <clears throat> but even now that we are maybe uh, uh, decades after the, the beginning of those movements, some anti capitalists who are not Marxists will focus on this failure and argue, based on a selective reading of history, that Marxism is thoroughly chauvinistic and intrinsically ill equipped to answer the questions raised by those struggles that are supposedly outside of class. Um, some anarchists seize upon these failures with the hoping to prove the superiority of their ideology. But more importantly, they, they are unwilling to confront the fact that the only real attempts to solve these problems as, mi minorita as minoritarian as they were, were Marxist attempts of uh, the gay liberation from the George Jackson Brigade, the LA Research Group, the Critiques of Sojourner Truth Organization. These were still initiatives, though sometimes unorthodox, <laughs> well, within the sphere of uh, Marxism, Latinism, and thus a sphere that quite often conjured the name of Mao Zedong. And uh, like here in Canada in 2015 now, <laughs> I hope to see uh, some of those initiatives going on, especially like last year, I think there's been the first uh, revolutionary anti-capitalist trans contingent in the trans proud demo in Toronto. And uh, our comrades in Ottawa are starting a, feminist, a proletarian feminist campaign for um, access to uh, employment to uh, female trans. So those things are still covered. <laughs> Um, does the narrative that communism as a theory failed because it could not address problems beyond a simplistic understanding of class is somewhat fallacious. Uh, what we are trying to do with the proletarian famous front in Canada is to say that class is not, uh, sorry, <laughs> that class is not above other oppression, is that all oppressions are through social class. Um, I mean, there's a major difference between a worker at uh, Tim Hortons and Pauline Marois, um, like both are females, but they are not facing um, sexism the same way. Same thing, like if you have disabilities and like you're living on social welfare, you don't have the same access to uh, to the services you need than somebody who have money to, to, to afford them. And you can go on with all those things. And eventually the bourgeoisie will maybe be able to, to, <coughs> to limit the effects of all those oppression for their own members, but it will never be the case for the majority of the proletariat who are actually, at, at the contrary, facing m the most uh, cruel exploitation because they cannot or they can, uh, yeah, they cannot uh, send their force of 
<laughs> their working force um, as efficiently than other workers. Okay. One minute or? Oh, uh, no, you're, no. Right, you're out of time, but if you, want, if you have a lot, of, uh, I don't want to cut you completely okay. off at all. I will, uh, one, sen l okay. one last sentence. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, we can see that some of these movements have succeeded in focusing on a revolutionary practice and what did we mean to produce and we should think about what did we mean to produce a movement that is not simply a theoretical movement of academics capable of ending oppression and exploitation thank you very much Getting out of the chair. No, that didn't, didn't count your time. That didn't count my time. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> dear friends, of course, it is impossible to get into the subject matter of anarchism in 12 sweet minutes. So I will highlight certain dimensions of it and then we'll get into the discussion. What is interesting here tonight is that uh, the turnout uh, indicates the debate continues. The debate that started, the struggle that started in the early 19th century, it still continues. And it should. Because there are many unresolved issues. As you probably know, anarchism has essentially three schools, three currents. There is anarcho-individualism, there is anarcho-syndicalism, and there is anarcho-collectivism or anarcho-communism. Each one is has its strengths and its weaknesses. Anarcho-individualism is a school way of thinking that has attracted, for example, people in the artistic community, musicians, celebrated musicians, celebrated painters, celebrated sculptors, and so on and so forth. And one can figure out why. <coughs> Anarcho-syndicalism, of course, is based upon the organization of uh, working people. And it involves the organization of working people in the fields, agricultural workers, industrial workers, and so on and so forth. And anarcho-communism is more communitarian and is based upon where one lives and how one interacts with one's immediate uh, social and political environment. But at the core of uh, Anarchism are two very important concepts. Two things that anarchists oppose tooth and nail. They oppose exploitation in all of its forms. Exploitation. But they also oppose domination. And this opposition to domination separates them from the Marxist tradition or 95% of the Marxist tradition. Because there are, of course, creatures like libertarian Marxists, libertarian socialists, who also oppose domination. And the overriding idea of anarchism is the pursuit of freedom. Freedom. And in pursuing freedom, there are objective factors to take into consideration, but they're also subjective factors. I mean, Marxism has no credible, in any of its schools, no credible a theory of the subjective. Whereas in anarchism, understanding the subjective is extremely important. So anarchists are also very much preoccupied in interpersonal relations, in sexual liberation, in the transformation of all social relations as they build a movement to transform society. 
Now, my perspective, <coughs> Adoni knows this, my perspective is that um, even though I was brought up with a great deal of theory and philosophy and so on and so forth, from the 60s, uh, sometimes people ask me, well, where were you born, Dimitri? And I say, I was born in a place called the 60s. <laughs> because, of course, it was an extraordinary decade that really shook up um, the world order. And I think no one will dispute the fact that in 1968, the famous 1968, was the closest the world came to revolution, world revolution. I mean, there's the, the, the literature that has been written on 68 alone is uh, absolutely incredible. And it's a mine, it's a mine uh, open to more research and more discussion, more reflection. So that's where I was born. And I would say en passant that uh, anarchism was introduced I would say anarcho-communist uh, anarcho anarchism was introduced in Quebec in 1966. So it's relative as an organized force, as an organized formation. <coughs> and, uh, it's, so it's a relatively uh, new uh, phenomenon uh, in Quebec and, and in Montreal, of course. But what my pre major preoccupation is, uh, friends, is to apply theory to practice. Theory to practice. And in applying theory to practice, what one learns in order to adjust theory to reality. This dialectical relationship is to me the core that has to, that has to engage us in any future building of a new society in the old. And so we always have to look for those kinds of uh, signals uh, of the relationship between the two and to see what actually works <coughs> on the ground and how you build how you build on what you have accomplished on the ground very concretely uh, towards a new future. And so for example uh, here in this city there are many successful um, projects, events that have been organized and inspired by anarchists and libertarian socialists. They have been mostly uh, projects, mostly realizations at neighborhoods and community, community based. They have not been uh, particularly um, visible or successful in the trade union movement, although they have been, of course, as you know, probably know, anarcho-syndicalists uh, in the trade union movement all over the place, they have not actually been very rooted in the workplace. That's what I have to say uh, to all of us here today. Uh, how can we identify where things are actually moving and how actually things are being built? Let me now skip out of Quebec and go to Greece. There, from 1974, when the anarchists and other students of the Polytechnic rose up against the American-sponsored dictatorship of the colonels, the movement, the, the anarchist movement, the anarchist idea has really gone and flourished and has developed into a rather substantial presence in that society. And it is something that has to be looked at very, very carefully <coughs> because it is a tendency, you know, people say, well, you know, about two years ago, some yo-yo called me from... Uh, the CBC uh, idea series, and they said, uh, we would like to invite you to be part of a three-part series on anarchism on the CBC idea series, which is a very well-known series on the CBC, as you know. And I said, well, tell me what are you going to 
what are the three parts? What are the three chapters you're going to deal with? Well, he said, the first chapter, we're going to have two <coughs> historians go to Paris, and they're going to explain to us uh, <coughs> the, uh, the the work or the, or, the, or the attempts of Ravachol. Ravachol was one of the first uh, terrorists who were inspired by anarchist ideas, and his his he he and Emil Henry uh, did some very nasty things in the name of. Uh, in the name of freedom, in the name of freeing the working class. And what they did in Paris uh, marred the anarchist uh, logo, if you will, for, for decades and centuries to come. You know, anarchists are by definition terrorists. There's no disputing it. Well, so that was what they were going to start. These two American historians happened to be Americans who were going to go to Paris, and they were going to trace um, the... Um, the bombing of the famous cafe uh, Terminus in, in central Paris. And I said, that's how you begin the hit, the, your, your reflection on, on anarchism? I said, why don't, you talk, why don't you start with William Godwin, for instance, you know? Way back at the beginning of the 19th century, he had, he had certain I interesting things to say about education, about philosophy, and so on and so forth. I said, well, what's your second chapter <laughs> all about? Their second chapter was, of course, they were going to go to Spain because there was a, a, an exhibit, a, a Senate exhibit uh, <coughs> in Spain, and they were going to deal with, with the, the, Spanish, uh, the, Spanish, the Spanish social revolution. And I said, and your third chapter? I said, well, we're going to go to Greece, and we need your help to go to Greece because in Greece there is the largest anarchist movement around. I said, look, Greece has many anarchists. Now, this was three years ago. Greece has many anarchists, but there's no anarchist movement. There is anarchist tendencies, but there is no federation. If you don't have an anarchist federation, you can't claim to have a movement. And a federation, an anarchist federation, is the sum total of various sections, various affinity groups across the society in which you work, and you work, you go about your business in a coherent and organized way. So don't talk to me about the biggest anarchist movement being in Greece. And he said, well, I'm sorry we disagree. And he started, by the way, <laughs> he started by trying to convince me by saying, Dimitri, I have no preconceived idea. I have no agenda. This is open, I said. You're full of shit. <laughs> you have a very clear agenda. I know exactly where you're going, and I want nothing to do with your program. And so, but they put the program anyways together, the, th the three-part series. It was a disaster. Uh, it was an embarrassment. Uh, it was something that uh, com was completely unacceptable. And without me prompting <coughs> anybody, you could see the emails that they got on the CBC website immediately after the third program. What is this shit? What is? What are you doing? You know, how do you do, do all this stuff? So, um, I'll wrap up by saying that I'm more interested in hearing what you know or do not know about anarchism, or Marxism for that is. I'm more interested in being here in debating and dialoguing with all of you present than uh, going on much further about anarchism. But I would like to say this. There are three volumes that have been published by Black Rose Books. They are the best anthology of anarchism that has ever been published. You can tell by the sales and the interest that they have generated. Uh, the first one deals with classical Marxism. The second uh, edition uh, deals with uh, anarchism of the 20th century, and volume three, which is really the meat and potatoes of the whole thing, is with anarchism in the 21st century. Thank you for your attention. All right. So I'll give the panelists an opportunity to respond to one another, maybe starting in the same order, Julian. And you really only have a, we want to keep it short and get to the audience. So really kind of think of your key points, uh, rather than sort of like addressing all the points things that sort of most um, stood in your minds. Um, 
amongst the other panelists. Uh, right away, um, um, pretty, uh, I pretty agree with you about the fact that uh, the the period that we are experiencing right now is is similar to the period when um, uh, um, anarchist moralism was pretty vast, extended, and there was there were like f uh, f forming of groups of tendency that wasn't. Uh, that uh, didn't succeed to establish an hegemony through parties or stuff like that. And w why I conclude, uh, the way I conclude in my presentation is the, the point in, in, in which I'm concerned is how can you manage to, in the part Marxist and anarchists uh, work together? Um, how can we share our experience <coughs> and, and build things, campaigns, <coughs> united fronts, stuff together to like um, strengthen the left? Because actually we're completely off the track and uh, we, we, we can't, uh, we aren't able to, to maintain the statu quo. So we, we can't even talk about uh, making gains we the the left is so weak that we we're not able to maintain like to stop the attacks thanks julian okay. yeah. no. um i mean i guess all i would say is that uh um i uh, the 20th century was well i feel like the the framing of the debate between marxism and anarchism is um a 20th century frame. Um, uh, and it grows out of certain 20th century experiences. Um, I think that uh, while that 20th century experience is incredibly relevant um, and uh, unavoidable, that um, there is a tendency to think that uh, uh, the twentieth century was sort of like as if it were uh, I don't know to use that lens to examine everything, both past and future. Um, if you go back, I mean, I, th I think it's just I think it's important to broaden the range of history within which we think about fights against struggles against uh, domination and exploitation. Uh, those struggles began earlier than the 20th century. And the lines of demarcation in the 19th century look different than the lines of demarcation in the 20th century. Um, the concern with domination, I'll disagree with Dimitri, Dimitri here, the concern with domination in the 19th century is all over, um, uh, it's not just all over anarchism, it's all over Marx too. Um, um, and it's all over a number of socialist thinkers. It's all over the early Owenites. Um, and it doesn't start there. They, receive, they are inheritors of uh, a conception and extenders of a conception of domination that they inherited from uh, Republican political thought uh, via certain uh, uh, radicals <coughs> like... Uh, um, um, uh, like Thomas Paine, uh, um, etc., at the end of the at the end of the 18th century, there there's a long history to thinking about domination. There's a long history to thinking about exploitation, and I think the disagreements are a little more fine grained and a little more uh, variable. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Yeah, really briefly, <coughs> I don't have any specific points to discuss, but like we, we talk a little bit about the 19th century and then a lot about the 20th century, but maybe it's me, <coughs> I don't have voice, but I'm really enthusiastic about this new century <laughs> and I hope <coughs> that I will find my voice back, but I also hope that this century will be different from the 20th century, but right now we, we, we have 15 years um, behind us, but um, and like while we can learn a lot of things from all those Marxism versus anarchism debates, I especially hope that this could emerge in a revolutionary movement for for, for for the century to come and not not only um, a debates between one way of, th of thought and another one but really uh, a revolutionary practice <coughs> well I just want to say very briefly 
<coughs> that my understanding of the term domination since it became an issue, is that for anarchists, domination is essentially a <coughs> political and psychological phenomenon. Exploitation has its dimension as an economic and social phenomenon. And if we accent the political weight of domination, of course, what anarchists have, which very few others have, is an anti-statist position. They want the state to melt away or implode, okay? because that, to them, is <coughs> the source of political domination, the political authority uh, of the state <coughs> over all of society. So there aren't many that I am aware of uh, in the theory and practice of the left who are as virulently against the state and authority as the anarchists. And that affects their whole perspective. That's why they're also anti-militarists. That's why they're also atheists, unlike a lot of the left, including the Marxist left. I remember once, for example, the theorist of the Canadian Communist Party, Stanley Ryerson, calling me on the phone and said, Dimitri, I want to invite you for dinner to meet Roger Garodi. Now, Roger Garodi was a well-known theorist of the French Communist Party, but he became an amoured with a dialogue between Christians and Marxists. To him, that was the cat's meow. That was a promising avenue for uh, for the future of the French Communist Party. I said, Stanley, I don't want to come to dinner with Roger Garodi. I'm sorry. I have nothing to say to Christians. That was the end of that. All right. Thanks, Dimitri. I'm so sorry. I just realized that we have to be done in 15 minutes. Oh Not uh, as I uh, had in my mind and my brain. So uh, let's take let's take five questions in rap rapid succession. Please be concise, and we'll. Uh, <laughs> I'm very sorry about this, but um, all right. Who'd like to go first? Okay, you you get the buzzer first. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um. So uh, I would just say that I think. Um, Will's intervention was maybe a little misleading, I would say, in terms of like the description of kind of having a restart, um, that we're kind of at this period in the beginning of the 18th century where Marx was kind of figuring himself out. Maybe I'm even mischaracterizing how you're describing it. But the point is also, as Marx is to develop an understanding of you know, the development of capitalism and the changes that, that it goes through. Um, and so that we're not, we can't really necessarily go back to just the, you know, start from the the Paris manuscripts or the earliest parts, you know, like forgetting his critiques afterwards, or the parts that he learned throughout the 19th century, whether it was, you know, through his, um, the lessons learned in 1848 or in 1871, and developing further his theory as it goes. So I don't, I mean, anyways, I would just say that that would be an important thing. Um, and then secondly, kind of leading on from that, um, something that I feel that is most important, I think, when we're trying to figure out what a relationship can be between anarchism and Marxism, um, and even within the Marxist movement or the anarchist movement, should be, I think, pretty paramount, the issue of, um, of imperialist war, for example, and which has pretty, <coughs> pretty much been the deciding factor in pretty major splits um, in those movements themselves, where you could have Kropotkin um, uh, be taking a militarist stand and supporting World War I, whereas other anarchists were, were against it, or in the Marxist movement, mm -hmm. what birthed the, the third the Third International, or and the uh, the Revolution in Russia to be this. Sorry, I have yeah. to wrap up. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, that's it. Fine. No, but take, uh, take, take, I mean, no, really finish your thought. I'm just I'm asking yeah. you to sort of come to a come to a close. Um. Okay. Well. Anyways, I think the desi the deciding uh, factor should be its re revolutionaries' relationship to imperialist war, and I think that that should be something that should have been rehashed by maybe the uh, the panelists. And I think also the incapacity also to deal with that, those issues as well when we have, say, like, you know, 
um, the problems they with Trotskyism and you know relating to the, the Second World War and what position they would take um, in imperialism there or the Maoists as well. Um, okay. For enemies, for that matter. Okay. Next, and uh, keep your hands. Put your hands up as you're as the, uh, you're asking the question, so I can pick the next person. Uh, I was just going to ask. Um, <coughs> Uh, you, you mentioned the Sino-Soviet split, and so that was kind of when socialism fell apart, and that was a very you know, sort of humanist critique of uh, <coughs> Stalin. And so I'm wondering if you think of that Marx's break from Proudhon's moralism as a break uh, with humanism and with the dialectic, and if that is the case, is there do you think there is such thing as like a historical materialism that we can turn to for a specific uh, way to create a revolution or so on? Okay. Uh, any other questions? Outside there? Yeah. <laughs> um, is technology important, or how is it important, especially for anarchists, and especially in terms of competition and inequality? Okay, thank you. Any other questions? How about in the back there? Do you have one? Okay, as a group. Anybody out there? I am very sorry. This is actually my fault. Um, but uh, panelists... Um, the, um, you have three questions on the floor here. The one is about the relationship uh, imperial, um, imperialist war, sort of how that sort of like comes to the division between uh, Marxism and an anarchism, how uh, that becomes a, a, a point. The si Sino-Soviet split, um, how that sort of conditions uh, will your own uh, perspective uh, in terms of the, this uh, hypothesis on moralism, and finally technology, how this factors into um, uh, um, these kinds of debates. Um, shall we start? Anybody would like to take it off? Well, I could respond to two <coughs> of the uh, three questions. One is on uh, war. It's about Kobani as well. Huh? It's Kobani as well, Royale. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned Kobani. How many people have heard in this room about Kobani, what's going on there and in northern Iraq? You know? There is a whole social revolution taking place in and around Kobani. But the, uh, anyways, it's a whole long story we could discuss, discuss later. <clears throat> well, let me say one <coughs> thing about technology. Um, the anarchists, the contemporary anarchists have uh, and I would urge you to read a classic piece of uh, writing by Murray Bookchin called Towards a Liberatory Technology. Um, it's still in print. It's in... Uh, Is it Black Rose? Uh, it's in one of the anthologies. I, for, I forget which one. But it's, it's, a, it's a major essay. And... The idea of a liberatory, te liberatory technology or a libertarian technology actually again goes back to the 60s when there was a very remarkable magazine that was published in New York called Liberation. And in one of the special issues of Liberation, it was actually the first that, uh, that talked about a triple revolution taking place in advanced capitalist societies and the significance of technology and the significance of a different form of technology. And that is where the idea of an alternative technology was actually born. So I would say that as far as uh, contemporary anarchism is concerned, we are very much preoccupied with technology and its sanguine effects of a certain kind of technology, its sanguine effects, in creating a society of post-scarcity. You want to discuss it more? There's a lot of beer out there on Crescent Street. Okay, I've got uh, Will then Julian. Um, I, I just say about the. I I did not mean to uh, imply an Althusserian line about uh, about the Sino-Soviet split. Uh, I I merely meant that the Sino-Soviet split and uh, secret Congress um, um, began a process of the dissolution of a of a sort of coherent meaning for Marxism um, uh, just because it was it was a, a crucial juncture at which uh, party formation started to go uh, in different directions um, um, so that's all I I mean which does it's not to say however that there's not um, that there's no room to talk about 
um, uh, the relationship between um, Marx's critique of uh, Proudhon and critiques of humanism, uh, because uh, um, uh, Proudhon was a consummate humanist. Um, but uh, but I just didn't. I'm not, I'm I'm not prepared to sort of. <laughs> oh yeah, salty service. Right? Mm -hmm. no, that was not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Julian. Yes. If you're interested into uh, readings about technology and revolution and Marxism and anarchism, uh, you you can read the uh, Costa Axelos classical about his Heideggerian reading of Marx, uh, called uh, Marx Thinker of the Technique, uh, or you can also uh, read the Unidimensional Man from Hébert Marcuse. Uh, but most um, con contemporary thinker of uh, of technique, uh, to name few, there's uh, Andrew Finberg who published uh, who, who launched a book last year here in Montreal about um, uh, the question of the technique. And also Jody Dean that I recommend, uh, that I highly recommend, uh, a, a Marxist from the uh, USA um, West Coast. And but um, what's in, what's is interesting <laughs> in, in their thinking is that uh, you can read also Serge Latouche is very interesting. But the the point is, <coughs> the danger is to to fall into the trap of like pessimism or optimism, and and see technology through uh, a mechanical way. Like, this is bad because it's got workers' jobs, or this is good because uh, everybody, uh, democracy will rule the world. Uh, it, the uh, Raniero Panzieri for the, uh, from the um, uh, communist uh, autonomous tradition in, in Italy, he has a, a very interesting uh, way of thinking about this uh, dialectical way of thinking uh, techniques from like all its alienating aspects and its emancipatory aspect, and the all the aspect that can alienate and and create more value, um, all the capitalists will will focus on that. But every new technique opens new door for uh, revolutionaries' uh, tactic or strategy. That but we we, we have to, to take those opportunities um, because it's 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 always a dialectical uh, relation with technology and new technologies. Catherine, you have the last word. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be really, really brief because I'm really sick. But uh, yeah, for sure. Um, for, the, for the question about technology, like for now under capitalism, technology is like it's useful, like all commodities that we can have. But for sure, it's, it, it's in between the end of the bourgeoisie. So they decide what they want to produce, what they decide in which direction they want to go. And like, yeah, there's a little part of human knowledge that is more or less under this influence, but for 95% of the influ of the development of all technological developments, it's mostly for profit and it's really limited and it's really weak. It's really weak. But at the same time, uh, the, the more and more the technology and the possibility of uh, technology uh, development uh, bring us closer to a classless society where everybody's need it will be fulfilled because it's getting so easier to just calculate how much oranges you need or how much coffee do you need or whatever so all those uh, processes uh, are something that we can be enthusiastic for because I think uh, it's going to get things really much easier than it was in 1917 uh, feud feudal Russia uh, to, to, to organize things and the issue of war is such an important one and I don't think we have like any time left to discuss it but I'm still glad that you, you bring this uh, up and like this has been an important issue and it's going to be one too like we talked a little bit about the first world war because like the imperialist war was kind of really on the land where many uh militants were actually uh, organizing but and now we we may have the impression that the wars are pretty far away but there's an, a, a full analysis about the fact that since the vietnam war almost all war in which the usa or their allies are involved are kind of a repetition of the same model with more or less variations and that like uh, as marxism or anarchism or anti-capitalism we could develop and discuss strategies uh about those issues and also be able to support those who are living on those lands who are occupied by imperialist wars and who are struggling on a daily basis, generally for the cost of their own lives. Thank you very much. Uh, a round of applause for our panelists.
<laughs> Again, I apologize for the miscalculation. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to put on the full two-hour panel next time we have an event. If there's anybody from Concordia, we do have a sign-up sheet to form the club here. We really could use your help, and there's also another sign-up sheet just if you want to get on our mailing list. I know there's some uh, leaflets and stuff outside the door from the various groups. Uh, and uh, just before we break up, I think um, a number of us would like to go for beer. Uh, what's a good place locally that could house a lot of people on short notice? Not that everybody's going to go, but I mean, if we had 10 people who went out. Any suggestions close by? The North Concordia Bar just next door? I think that one's close enough right now. There's <laughs> Irish Embassy. Yes. They have a lot of space usually. like They're quite big. What, is it just on the street? It's on... It's Bishop, but it's just okay. down, yeah, yeah further down. Right. Are, Which are place? you guys going? I don't know. Okay. It's just down the street. This gentleman here with the great, uh, the great question is going to be uh, leading, uh, leading you down there, and we'll all join you afterwards. That's, okay. a, that's a leader you can follow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Again, I apologize, and thanks to the panelists for... Yeah, thank you for all organizers, too. Yep. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> I'm just going to go home. Like, oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my second presentations in a row, so. Oh, no. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Yeah, Très dangereux.